So, hi, my, my name is Marc Verdiel, also known as Curious Mark on the channel where the whole restoration has been filmed and put up on videos. And uh, th this is lots of work, so that cannot be done by one person. So, it's a collaboration mainly between the, the four of us Carl Clownch, Ken Sheriff, Mike Stewart, and then uh, myself. And we had a few sponsors along the way. And so, I'll, uh, I, I won't get too much into the technicals of the AGC, but t more talk about the restoration story and the saga because it took us a while to get it going. Uh, wrong side. Okay, so the Apollo guidance computer, I'll say AGC in the rest of the talk. So, anyhow, well, people are moving, so they, uh, you, you might or might not know that there were actually four computers in the Saturn V rocket, which is this big E rocket that got us on the moon in the 1960s. Uh, there is one made by IBM that's called the LVDC, and that controlled the booster itself. Uh, then that was once you are uh, out of the atmosphere and in, in uh, orbit that gets uh, ditched. And then you have three more computers that are in the LEM and the command module. There's two of the AGCs, one in the LEM, one in the command module. They, is, they are the same machine with a different software running on it. And the LEM has an extra safety to it. It has a, a computer called the AGS, the Abort Guidance System. And that one is more like a, a KIM one, right? You, have, you just have the hex address and the hex number on it. And it will just get you back to orbit in case of an abort when we are descending with the LEM. So much more restricted computer. So we're, we're going to talk about the, uh, the AGC. The LVDS is really hard to talk about it because it's still embargoed. It's missile guidance. So we have some stuff about it, but we can't talk about it. Uh, it looks like this. Um, so it's uh, come, so th that's the computer itself. And that's the disk key, that's uh, display, the display keyboard unit. So that was kind of revolutionary at that time to have a computer that small. Um, it's uh, 70 pounds. And also to have a computer that has a real-time display. And it, when this is on, this looks like a, se a cell phone flat screen display. It's pretty impressive. And, but that's, that's how you were interacting with that computer in the 1960s. Uh, we'll go into more into that. Uh, it's, uh, I, have, I have a good picture for the command module, but not for the lamp. So it's stuck over here. I see it says Apollo guidance computer. Usually you don't see that part because it's covered. With, with a wall, uh, and then now we are having other pieces. Actually, we got pretty much uh, a little bit over half of the electronics now in the lab. Uh, on the LEM, it's on the back wall, and remember that in a few uh, view graphs that will become important. Uh, so I remember we uh, had Dan Lickley come at the Computer History Museum to be interviewed, uh, and he's one of the programmers of the uh, Apollo Gators computer. He programmed the re-entry. There was actually a large group uh, programming that, that, that computer. And the first question was, is, what did the AGC do? And he thought for a second, he said, it did everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he is absolutely right. I mean, the whole spacecraft depends on that freaking computer. So it depends on it for orientation. So it's attached to the IMU, the, um, uh, the gyroscopic platform. Right, so it knows the orientation. Uh, it controls all the burns. You know, you tell the, the spaceship to burn to a certain delta V in a certain direction to achieve a certain orbit, and it'll get you there. Uh, it's also, when you take the thing over manually, you don't. It's a fly-by-wire system. First one ever, and of course the first fly-by-wire system that you do, you do it on, an, on a spacecraft, like why not? Uh, it's, of course, very important to fly the LEM. Uh, the LEM was not considered flyable uh, by a human being. It's a, it's a suicide landing, basically, right? Like, like the uh, SpaceX rockets do, and you can't do that by hand, uh, or not, at least not with the fuel you have allocated. Uh, there's also the guidance during re-entry, so very, very important. Um, it was developed at uh, MIT, Link, uh, MIT Instrumentation Lab, now Draper's Lab, the, the champions of uh, inertial guidance. 
And this is the Eldon Hall, the principal engineer. Remember that picture. Uh, I'll come back later. Uh, so I'm going, I have lots of view graphs. I'm not sure I'll go to the end of it, so I'm going to go pretty quickly. Uh, Unlike the LVDC, which was a very conservative IBM system, the one, the Saturn thing, this is like the uh, MIT guys have at it, and they'll, uh, they, they, it's a very advanced system for the time. So it's the first time anybody you know, have a, 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 an aircraft, even a spacecraft, <laughs> entrusted to a computer. Right? So that's a big step. Uh, I, I told you it's very small for a computer of that time. It's uh, very light, it doesn't cost you much power. Actually, it's 55 watts, I think. This is not 70 watts, so even less than that. First computer to ever use ICs. So that's a very important thing. Um, and that was a very uh, revolutionary decision. To tell you how early it was, Eldon knew that he was going to run into trouble. They, he, they had made prototypes with transistors or even with core logic, and they, they, were, they knew they were running out of space, so he was eagerly uh, uh, awaiting the first ICs. And they were late, they were late, they were late, and he gets eventually one from TI and one from Philco, and then he gets 35 from Fairchild. And he quickly goes testing the 35 from Fairchild, you know, the form, the, 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 the will become the Intel guys, right? They work. Write some memo, we have 35, we tested them, they work, we need to change over to that. Right? I don't see why they would be any more, any less reliable than transistors. Or so it's, it's a very visionary decision, and basically, to this day, this is what brought up Silicon Valley and ICs, right? 80% uh, of the ICs in the 1960s were for that program for that one computer. And since they knew that they had to ramp up an, an industry, so we're going to make it simple on you, we're going to use one IC. Just make a lot of them very reliable. So that, that's a very, very gutsy decision uh, when you go to the moon. Today, you wouldn't do that, right? <laughs> Put new stuff on, on a rocket. Uh, it's interactive, uh, very advanced uh, and innovative on the OS, multitasking OS checkpoint it, and when it crashes, it recovers, and that basically saved the mission. My, my, when I crash, my Microsoft Windows machine doesn't recover, so I'm still <laughs> waiting for that. Uh, and d designed by MIT, built by Raytheon, very experienced contractor. Uh, oh, how do you get hold of an EGC, right? It's, uh, it's not one that you have played with when you were a kid in here. Uh, uh, so, the story of ours is, is kind of uh, complicated. It started in LEM LTA8 in Houston, not very far from here. Where, uh, so, it's a fully functional uh, pre-production com computer, but it's exactly the same that, as the one that flew. Uh, and they actually flew missions in vacuum. Uh, with astronauts in it for whatever, 10 days or 14 days, whatever it took. Uh, one, so there are two vacuum chambers. One uh, was the command module, uh, and the other one was the LEM. Ours was in the LEM, so that's the LT8 mission, so it's proving that you could actually fly the thing. So in vacuum, being baked on one side and cooled on the other side is actually a pretty risky thing, actually. Yeah. Because if, if they had a leak, they, they couldn't bring it back very quickly uh, up. Uh, so, uh, as I told you, the, uh, on, on, the, on the LEM, the, the AGC is called the LGC, the LEM Guidance Computer. And it's in the back, and it's LTA8, and I saw it last Thursday on, in Houston. It's on display, and then if you can peek through the window, you should see an AGC, and there's no AGC! <laughs> Because the AGC had been sold to the scrappers. Exactly. The AGC had been used, so very often, there they, they are very few parts, they reuse everything. So even in the, um, in the capsules that you see in the museum, they have taken the AGC out and they have been, re re have been reusing, it. particularly the IMU is the first one to go, gets reused for something else. This one uh, was used somewhere else, and then it was at the end of the Apollo program. No, Apollo is old stuff. We're going to go shuttle and then go to Mars, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, so they dispose of it, uh, and it ends up in uh, Houston at a scrapper, signature of Eldon Hall. He, he's okay, you can get rid of it. It's government stuff, you auction it off. If nobody wants of it, it goes for $10, which is actually what happened. So it goes at a scrapper, and this man, Jimmy Locke, is uh, he makes electronic gizmos with recycled parts. He likes to visit scrappers. He had been a technician for a few months on the Apollo program, like everybody in Houston, you get involved in it. And he goes to his scrapper and he recognizes the stuff being Apollo. And he likes old stuff, right? Who doesn't, right? And the scrapper really doesn't want to deal with this stuff. It's full of weird materials, some of it's radioactive, molybdenum, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't know how to melt it. So he wants to get rid of it, and Jimmy says, uh, can I have some of it? He says, sure, and he takes two tons of it. <laughs> Which he has been selling to this day, right? Not knowing what's in it, he doesn't know that he has the AGC in it. So he'll discover that uh, afterwards. Then Mike Stewart, who, who is really the lead of the project, this is a young engineer. And a uh, space engineer, he writes uh, space guidance software, right? And he's a good engineer, so he's aware of history, right? Those are the higher tier of engineers. <laughs> and uh, he is working to uh, do simulations. On, if you don't know if you guys have played with Orbiter, it's very accurate simulation down to the switch and blah, blah, blah. To make the thing work, uh, you need an emulation of the AGC. He makes a software emulation, and somehow that doesn't quite work. He makes it from the NASA documents. And he says, well, in order to figure out uh, what the problems are, I really have to make a hardware gate-by-gate -gate replica. And he goes on a whole you know, years of work to get the true schematics. He gets them from Eldon, eventually. You know, the actual engineer squirreled them away makes an FPGA gate exact replica and it still doesn't work. You say, ah, I have to get my hand on a real one and beep it out. And he knows that Jimmy is exhibiting his. Uh, he, wants, he wants to sell it, right? So he wants to exhibit it. So I agree. And he asks Jimmy, can I open it up and beep it out? And Jimmy says, sure. <laughs> So he goes, opens it out, and why does that? Jimmy asks him, you say we could power it up? <laughs> and we say, well, that would be cool, right? And then he reaches out to us. No, he has not done restorations, and we are sort of known by the CHM work and the Alto work. So that's how we end up with it working on an AGC. And there it is. Uh, we are told uh, in, in, it, it takes us about you know, two minutes to decide that we're going to do it. We buy tickets to Houston. Jimmy doesn't want to be separated from his computer, so he doesn't want us to go to his home either. Uh, he's not very rich. He's a little bit embarrassed. We rent a hotel room in a suite in Houston, uh, in a motel. <laughs> <laughs> he brings his computer and we start going at it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is how I, the first time I saw that, no, pinch me, this was for us. We, we, we have been dreaming of this computer, it's such a pioneering machine, brought me on the moon. So that's how we felt. And so I come into the room and I see that for the first time. And it's made in two trays one tray has the memory and one tree has most of the logic. Memory is hard uh, to support, right? It's core memory, you need a lot of stuff around it. The, the core memory is in that black module here, we'll talk about more later, uh, but all the rest support for that. Uh, cl closer look at that beautiful uh, Raytheon uh, module in the same style as they were do putting in their missiles, basically. The backplane is wire-wrapped. Uh, this is done three levels done uh, by a Gardner Denver, Denver automatic machine. Wire wrapping is uh, more reliable than soldering. That's why you do it. Okay, uh, we got uh, Ray, Ray Theon number 14, and it's uh, part of the series of 15 of the pre production before they get the actual flight ones. And this is one of the modules. It's a pre-production, hallelujah, it's not potted. 
we can actually see the components because all this would be, uh, including the back plane, that would be in plastic, right? you can't change it. And so this one might be a repairable and you look inside what's in it and I was flabbergasted. This is surface mounted components, right? So all the, all the same circuits, by the way. This is not solder, this is welded. This stuff has nails. And what it's welded on is a seven layer PCB. So this is technology you wouldn't see until the 1990s, right? They, they, had, they had to invent how to do all that. Right? Um, so the rare case where space stuff is years, years, years in advance from terrestrial stuff. Um, so I told you there was just one type of circuit, I sort of lie, there's another circuit which is also a first. It's the sense amplifier circuit. There are uh, only uh, eight of them and they are over here in the little TO cans. The, the red things are the transformers. So they had one, the first digital IC circuit, which is an OR gate, and the first analog uh, IC, which is basically a comparator. Uh, and we have two modules that don't belong. They are potted, they come, they are not part of the original build, they have been put in there. And when it's potted, it's all black like this. And you don't have access to any components. So they are related to memory. One is the current switch module B11. And the other one that uh, Mike is puzzling about is the core memory itself, which is also potted. And what are the chances that are false? Well, of all the unpotted modules that we have will be in the potted modules. Right, um, so Mike, we are super prepared, uh, not because of us, but because of Mike. He has gotten all the schematics, as you can see, all the same circuit everywhere, all three input NOR gates. Uh, 5200 gates, I think, like that. And that's Mike's FPGA model of it. So we have a, a, a solid model of it. And then even these little glitches, we will, so we'll use that all the time, we'll find them in the real one. So it's extremely exact, as you expect from an FPGA model. He has made a backplane model, so it's, it, the thing is on, on the web, actually, you can, you can use it. You click on one pin, and it tells you all the other pins it attached to. Also very, very useful. Uh, so we start uh, checking all the modules one by one, uh, trying to see if they are good. Most of them are, actually, all of them are good but one. Uh, the divider module that divides the clock that it doesn't work correctly and they repair it by shaking it. <laughs> and the reason they did that because it was a known fault on this early uh, batch of computers that they, 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 they had metal flakes inside the circuit. So, uh, so we, first we check gate by gate, but after we find that they are all good, we, we, we go quicker. Uh, the power supply checks amazingly good. The, 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 the four volt power supply scheme comes up at 3.99 volts and the, the, actually this one comes at 4.00 volts and the 15 volt power supply comes up at 14.99 volts. And of course we check the caps and all that stuff. They are tantalum caps, so they, they are, they're all good. They're very, totally abnormal. You don't, you don't get a power supply to come up like this from 50 year old hardware. And that's where the difficulty begins. Our first part of the module, we check the core memory. The core memory, you know, it's hard to check for the memory because you need all the support, but you can check it's wires that go through little ferrite tours. So you can check if you have a wire are connected to each end, right? And Mike checks every single wire. There is one that appears broken. And uh, there we are sort of scratching our head how we're going to repair this. Um, and so, meaning we have no RAM in this computer, right? ROM, so ROM is core rope. It's another hard wire form of uh, core memory, and there is none in there. So instead, they have a core rope emulator because core rope is ROM, right? You, you can't change the software on it. So instead, they have this box, which is undocumented, made by Raytheon, which connects to a real computer, which would download the software so we can do iterations on it. We don't know what it is, and Ken and <laughs> Trosa Sharp Straw is our uh, reverse engineer extraordinaire, and he goes right at work in the hotel room, and you see the master at work with his diagrams, and we'll see where that goes. Um, I brought my logic analyzer uh, after we get comfortable that the modules we tested work. Uh, we start it with, without the RAM and without the ROM, see if we get clock cycles, and the first thing we see is this. 
uh, this pulses, which is actually the sequencer for the processor, and it's trying to hit the address it should hit when it resets. And it's even reading something wrong from our uh, indexing memory and trying to boot. And now we are very surprised. We didn't expect that to happen. So it's trying to boot the uh, first time we try. And then uh, Mike uh, has a brainwave and he goes back on the bed and starts to program. And he, he has a, uh, an, another of these FPGA board that he had made his replica with. And he tries to make a memory emulator on the fly, which also needs uh, level shifters. So <laughs> I brought enough stuff. He, he brings his stuff in. We wire it in. And we can, it, it goes through a couple of hundred instructions because before it goes off the rail, which we didn't expect either. So that's way better than we expected. And we are, that's the end of our two weeks. We just worked uh, from uh, 7 a.m. to midnight every day. And uh, we got there and we were just elated. Everybody goes to their, um, to their respective flights and come back home. Uh, without the computer, which stays with Jimmy. I come back home with the uh, core memory module, try to find where, uh, if we can see the wire break. We knew that they had had failures near the pins uh, in the early memory module, so we hope it's there, and then we can just drill a hole and fish the line. Uh, we put it, I work for Samtech, the, we have this huge 3D X-ray machine, and they put it in there and we can't find the break. So no break near the pins. We know exactly which pin it is it's around here. Then I bring it back to the lab. We do TDR to send a pulse, see if it comes back. And then uh, if it does come back from the echo, you can measure how far it is. And it turns out, it tells us the fault is right in the middle of the module. We do the same thing with, I'm, I'm well equipped, as you know. We do the same thing in frequency domain and measure the resonance of that wire, which should behave as an antenna. It gives us the same answer, smack in the middle of the module. So that module is not repairable. We have to work around it. And I'll show you how we did that uh, later. Uh, Carl is our um, props extraordinaire. Uh, he likes to make reproductions, so he makes a disk key. We couldn't use a commercial disk key because the commercial disk key are hooked up to a computer. What we want is one that takes the signal logic from the AGC, right? which is a complicated thing. Um, so he does that. We have the problem of the connectors here. This is, these are very weird connectors that we only find on this, called Malco connectors. And uh, fortunately, I work for a connector company. They, <laughs> <laughs> they retool the thing and made a soft tooling so it was not too expensive. But it's, it's in the many tens of thousands of dollars to do that. And no, we had the actual drawing from NASA for the pins. I gave it to the engineer, and the young engineer was like, oh, it says no manned space flight center NASA. He was all excited. We were all excited. So I didn't, I didn't need to, uh, to, 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 to spend too much of my CTO power to get that going. Everybody was, uh, <laughs> was good with it. Uh, now, how do you test it? Well, it's actually a, a blink and light machine. It has a whole tester, and it has a test port. That's a small port on the side. You see the port to the right, that's the test port. That hooks up to this thing, uh, on which we don't have much documentation, but we have a Mike Stewart, and he uh, makes another of his SPGA thingies that emulates the thing and then some more. And ta-da, he can now talk to uh, the computer, and he has all the blinking lights, he even has a, a disk key. And what he's testing, he has his FPGA testing on is FPGA AGC over here. So, so we are super ready when we finally, uh, well, I, I did fly out Jimmy, his wife, the computer, <laughs> so they wouldn't be separated for two weeks uh, at my place. So here we, we are, we got the AGC, which by the way, got lost by the airline for a couple hours. So we're, oh. <laughs> which if I, even worse, because by that time we had press with us. We had the Wall Street <laughs> Journal and they film us. We are all decomposed. We lost the AGC and the GOAS, no, the United doesn't know where they are, but eventually it reappeared on the next flight. Uh, and then, so now we can really work on it. Uh, we have all the tools. Uh, we'll need to do some rewiring. We are in a proper situation. We have the testing equipment so we can see everything that's happening in it. So, by this point, we know it works. We need ROM and RAM, right? 
so Ken is doing the ROM boxes and he has all the trouble in the world because although they were made by Raytheon, it's not space qualified and that behaves like normal electronic for 50 years. Nothing works, we have shorts, we have bad transistors, uh, we have wires that are disconnected, uh, then we repair everything, we plug it in, it still does not work. And that has us really puzzled because it, if it doesn't work now, it probably didn't work then. So we have to make a modification to the design uh, and change a little bit of timing and put those two capacitors. Um, and it was another transistor that was not connected to. Maybe the box was in development, not fully finished or we don't know. Anyhow, eventually uh, we get uh, Ken's ROM emulator to be seen by Mike's tester. So we've got ROM. Uh, and by the way, uh, in many years before, from a listing, Mike had recompiled the Apollo 11 software because there was a listing of it, which he also got from the old timers. So now we have to figure out what we do with RAM. And before we go to the RAM itself, we, we need to uh, test the RAM modules. They all test good. And then comes the turn of our B11 module, which is one of the RAM modules that, di that didn't belong. So the RAM itself is the support modules, current switching for the address. And Mike discovers it has two fold in it, two folds in it, and he thinks it's bad diodes. And once again, it's a fault that they had caught uh, before the production. And we think we are victims of it. And it's spotted, so we have no solution we have to get in it. So it goes into the mill. Yeah, so we try, of course, all the chemicals known that we know that we can use. It doesn't do anything to that uh, military party. And then we mill it until we see wires. And then we go with dental tools. And eventually, we get all that. And we didn't know. We, we think we, we were doing something that we should absolutely not do. But very, very later on, uh, we bought some other pieces of Apollo. And there were modules with holes like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually how they repaired it. And the lady that repaired it was called Mary. And that's how they did it. They were very rare. When they had a module fail, they had very little of those components. They would try to repair it. Now, that's for the ground. That wouldn't fly, obviously. So what we were doing was actually correct, and we didn't know. Uh, it's also it's welded, right? It's nickel wire welded. So it won't let go. The wire will break before the weld breaks. So that, that makes it uh, fairly reliable. And yeah, it's bad diodes. And you can see inside, it's cordwood construction. So it's, it's a block of aluminum, and the analog components are in there. So this is an analog module. The digital modules, they are the seven layer PCB. The analog module, they are cordwood, right? They are point to point. And of course, we, for those who are in the valley, they know about anchor electronics, which are sole remaining uh, source of old parts. Do you have one N914s? Of course, 10 cents each, right? They haven't changed their prices <laughs> till 1960 something. So we get that. And ta-da, we put two new diodes in, and then you can see the, So this, this is core logic module, by the way. It, it gets, they use big cores to give a big pulse to the small cores that are in the memory. And you can see the core flipping one way and the core flipping the other way. There's a trace at the bottom. We've repaired it. And uh, it's all happy until Mike discovers another fault in the same module. And this time, it's bad. It's a short. So short are the worst case of faults. And we don't know exactly, we know exactly in, in which uh, uh, part it is, but we don't know exactly what, you know, at which point it is. And so we go back in, dig another cavity. We figure out that there's a short indeed, exactly where we thought it was. And then eventually you figure out exactly where it is. And it's in the big core module that produces the pulse. So you need a 500 million pulse to yank the memory, right? So uh, that's the only core logic uh, section that remains. And it's between two wires in that thing. So a core memory is very easy to zap. Uh, if you, if you, because you, you put such huge pulses, if, if it stays on, it's going to burn your stuff. Probably a mishap happened. They got it stuck at high. They burned the stuff. 
and they say, oh, okay, that's, uh, we'll take the other module from, <laughs> we'll put our bad one, and that's why our two potted modules are bad, right? They don't belong to this computer. They were probably part of the same experiment that burned the wires. So how, how can we repair that? This is potted inside a potting, and it shows only a few turns, but it's hundreds of turns, so no way we can do it. It's very weird core that you can't find. Uh, fortunately, it's, there are several windings, so uh, first I have an idea of we take one winding, we invert it in a transformer, and then eventually we figure out, oh man, if we just use a PNP transistor, we can recreate the, the, the winding and the pulse that we are missing, um, which would be great, right? It's a simple thing, and you need to uh, clip and snip and rewire. And ta-da, here is the extra PNP transistor. And they were wondering, why didn't you, they use the PNP transistor? And I think they didn't have very good PNP transistor at that time. Uh, and ta-da, it works. We have our pulses going that way. So now, that's our module at the end. Uh, we had <laughs> the two diodes, holes, and the repaired module. So, and uh, one more thing, now, now we have to figure out how we replace our, our lost bit. So we have a lost inhibit wires, which means this is a machine that has 16 bits, and we have one bad bit at all locations, right, on the, on the, on the 2K words of memory, 4K bytes. But it turns out that they use 15 bits of data and one bit of parity. So what we do, we swap in the bit of parity to our bit that's dead, and we disable parity checking. And to do that, I think it's six wires that you have to rewire. I, I have them all written down like this, and it's wire wrapped. So you carefully unwrap the thing, and you put it, and you mark it, and you put a new wire, and you do that. And so after we'd, we've done, we were ready to put the last modules in. And by that time, uh, there's a lot of people in the lab. We have a uh, Wall Street Journal uh, filming crew. And we're preparing for the big experiment. And that's where, uh, how do I launch this thing? I go here. So will it run? Can you try to run something on it? Should I just press go? Yeah. See you again. Okay. Here we go. You got a disk hooked up? Or? Well, virtual disk. Virtual disk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, watch current. Same. One, seven, four. Hasn't changed. Okay. Here it goes. Two, 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 seven. Oh, it's running. Yeah. We got oh, it. Oh, on, on its own memory. Yeah. On its own memory. That's great. So. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're about nine months into the thing at that point, and, and it was it's like we had landed on the moon for us. <laughs> 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 okay, well, we, we, we already saw that one. Okay, so first thing we do, we have it fully working. We have the original uh, RAM on it. Its core memory it still has its memory in it, should, after 50 years. We dump it. Uh, one pass. Reading memory is destructive, by the way. So we could, and, and since we have one bad bit that we're going to replace, we are going to wipe it out. So we dumped it. Once we got all the data, checked out good, and it told us which program they were running in the last time, and the orientation of the IMU. And since it has an IMU, it, it also gave us the, the the latitude, and it goes straight in the middle of the Johnson Space Center. So the last time it was running, it was at the Johnson Space Center, it, because it knew where it was. Um, and then, now we have a good AGC, meaning it can read other ropes, right? We know where there is another rope. At the Computer History Museum, where the four of us do work, there is one on the wall that they wouldn't let us touch. <laughs> and we say, well, no, we have, no, ours is working now, can we just dump the ROM? And they have the, it's, it's very, very difficult to uh, convince them. And finally, we get the exception, and we have all kinds of people from museum hawking over us. We, we go and, and take them out, and 
we got it. We, we got it to work. We recovered the software. We run it in front of them. And now all of a sudden, they want all the footage of my restoration. <laughs> <laughs> We make it to the newspaper and uh, the local newspaper. Uh, that's, that's a picture at the museum, actually. Uh, and also to Wall Street Journal. And that's the core rope as we read it. It's in, out of order. And then Mike finally gets to do what he wanted. Right? Remember, that was to make an exact simulation in Orbiter with the exact um, computer and flying the real software. Except now, it's not flying with an emulation, it's flying with the real one. <laughs> so he goes, hooks it up to Orbiter, and he makes landings with the Apollo 11 software. Uh, so uh, remember Eldon Hall, right, the designer? This is, so it's July 2019, we are trying to hit the 50th anniversary. And uh, I didn't go to that trip, but Mike and Carl went there. And this is Eldon, and he's watching his computer work. You, you have the, the computer on the side over here. And Mike will fly a landing in front of him. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away last year. And 98 or something like that. And uh, we, we uh, took it to several museums uh, on the East Coast Line Landing, and eventually we took it to the MIT uh, Draper's Lab, the MIT Museum, and the people from Draper's Lab came, including Don Isles, a uh, programmer that wrote the landing. And, and uh, you know, while we are flying, the, the, the whole, the, like 10 programmers come and go in the front row. <laughs> I was like, wow, I was sort of awestruck. And he says, uh, casually, oh, by the way, I have a few more ropes. Do you want to read them? <laughs> <laughs> so all those guys are stashed away pieces of Apollo in their pockets, in their attics. In their <laughs> yeah, because NASA was going to lose them, right? It's your, your whole work. You have not, no, nobody has told anybody the good work you were doing, right? And they were going to throw it away. Uh, then our... Uh, computer cells uh, in 2021, which was the ultimate reason why the owner wanted it functional, right, to sell it at a higher price, which he did uh, reach uh, three quarter million dollars, which is three times the one that sold before. And it's always, I was mad about that, Carl let his replica go. <laughs> so you should have kept it, so the guy calls us. <laughs> and we know, so we still don't know who has it. I totally expected, Somebody bought, paid a huge premium because it was working, but you can't make it work unless you have the tester, the disk key, the blah, blah, the software. So I was expecting the, f the, the phone to ring, and it never rang. So we don't know where it went. Maybe Elon Musk or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think e Elon Musk would have called us. I'm thinking Jeff Bezos. <laughs> he would be the more secretive type. Or, no, God knows, Was there right? Any restriction on who you could sell to? No. Uh, actually, I don't know. There might be. They might have been. This, uh, our auction has some items that are US citizen only. So our auction can't tell you anything. To, we ask like 10 times, right? but they, they, they wouldn't tell us. They can't. So usually we have, when Mike is here, he'll bring his AGC, um, his replica version, and we'd fly a landing. But he's not with us today, and it's, it's kind of complicated setup, so we won't do uh, landing, but uh, so that's when it stops in the video series. But we have done more work since then. I'll touch a little bit on that. So, still, genius Mike. Uh, we don't have an AGC. How is he going to read more ropes? Well, he's making a core rope reader, <laughs> and with the uh, that's the same design of the case as the AGC, but it's much smaller, of course. And it's very neat. You get your core rope from whomever gives it to you. <laughs> you stick it in the thing, and now you connect it via USB to your computer. <laughs> what about that? Isn't that better than a, 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 a thumbnail, right? <laughs> Some drive, I mean. <laughs> and so he's after a few difficulties, and you can see this one didn't quite read properly. He's able to read ropes, so core ropes. That's what's inside that module. So they are very different from uh, core memory. It's much bigger tours, the, the same that actually are used in the, in the module that was broken. And the, the software is literally woven in. 
So here are ladies that are weaving in uh, software. It's manual, so this must be block one. And you end up with something like that. So, And explaining it is impossible. This is Mike trying to explain how Coro works. And I still haven't made a video from <laughs> a year ago <laughs> because I have, to, I have to figure out a simple way to explain it. And it's not simple. Uh, there are weird circuits. This one trips the, 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 the moon deniers because it has diodes going both ways. But if you have, it's, it's, it's just used as a switch. So if you have work in any magnetic circuit, this is a very well-known circuit. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's an analog thing, actually. It's complicated. Uh, so where do you find ropes? Well, this is at uh, Mike at Steve Jarvetson's. And you see it come out of an RL10 over there. You see the Apollo couches, a hatch, thing like that. And he has this thing, which is the F8 digital fly-by-wire pallet. And it has a, an AGC in it. It has actually the IMU, the inertial platform right here. And that's what it was in the plane. So after they made a spacecraft fly-by-wire, they tried it on an aircraft, which is much more difficult. Because spacecraft, it's perfect. You're in vacuum. You can predict everything. An aircraft, you're in the air, there's drag turbulence, all that kind of stuff. So the AGC pallets over here, and you have a disky hanging off the side right there. Look, ma, there's a disky in my plane. There you go. And so we take a few panels off, and sure enough, we find the ropes. And it turns out this is the Apollo 14 LEM test software, how it ended up in the F8 fly-by-wire system, we don't know. We didn't expect to find the uh, fly-by-wire system because this is probably secret. Uh, but LEM14, come on. <laughs> uh, another one that he did very recently, actually he was in Houston last week, uh, are even older modules. They are different. He had to build a second uh, version of, of his uh, contraption to read that. Uh, for those who have seen the AS202 video, it's uh, it's it's aboard the Hornet, which is the uh, ship that, uh, uh, how do you say, rec recovered Apollo 11. And, uh, but the capsule that's on there is from the second flight of the, uh, second test flight of the Saturn V. And we knew nothing about that software. Uh, except that, actually I found this after the facts, it was not, not, not our but all this, the first time they flew the AGC and had it execute all these commands and go to predetermine orbits and fire the engines. And it is this weird thing. So, so first the LVDCs are totally normal. Then they, f they fire up the, uh, the, service, the service module, the big engine, the second time. And then they have this little, little burst of three seconds, probably to test how, uh, how well they can relight it. And uh, Mike didn't expect that at all. So, but he, so he gets the software, and now we, when you have the software, we fly it. So there's a video where you can see uh, Niklas, who is, the, uh, who is the one developing the orbiter for, for, the, uh, for the flights right now. And he, he runs through the whole flight, and you can see go ahead doing these three-second things. Um, another thing that we have been doing, we, oh, we fly an Apollo 11 landing. So after a few crashes, because we're bad astronauts, we finally get the hang of it, we land. What we do next, we are going to inject 1202s, right? <laughs> so I build hastily a little box. I take all the NASA report. We know exactly what signals we are supposed to get to fool the computer. I hook up my box, and we fly, and yay, Mike gets the 1202. And then in the middle of it, it's pretty close to the surface of the moon. He yells for me to take my thing off because he's about to crash. He has lost control of the vehicle. And so I turn it off, he lands, and we just say, that's not supposed to happen. No, they flew through the 1202, and we did exactly uh, as NASA had told us to do it. And then we went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and we f you found out that the 1202 is caused by this other box. So this is the computer, the AGC. This is the CDU, and this is the analog digital D2A, A2D, five channels, 15 bits. Right? And this is the box that failed. And we started to go into it, and we convinced ourselves that there was way more to the story that had not been reported. And that actually, it's, 
it would take like another talk to go through it. But they, they got lucky. There are some configurations where you crash and some configuration that where you don't crash. And it's somewhat random. It depends on the phase between two power supplies and where your antenna is pointing. And there are more regions where you crash than regions where you don't crash. So before we advance our theory, and there's a guy that got a medal saying that oh, we are go on that one, and they were not go at all. It was this complete abort situation. And we talked to Don Isles, he's like, how did they fly through this? Well, you're not supposed to get 1202, you're supposed to abort. Anyhow, we think we got lucky, uh, but it's such a big difference with the historical record. We wanted to replicate it with the real hardware. So we, we had been looking for a CDU for a long time. And POM, one comes up at auction, Mike buys it. Well, there's, there's not much competition on that. Nobody knows what a <laughs> CDU is, is it, right? Uh, and it's sold as a uh, command module CDU. And we want a LAM CDU because the fault happened to LAM. They are slightly different. But eh, well, they're close enough. The part that failed are the same. So we are like, OK, fine. We'll take it nonetheless. He opens it up, and it's a LAM CDU. <laughs> Not only it's a LAM CDU, but it's a LAM CDU in the Apollo 11 configuration. So we lucked out, and we, we, I don't know, but one of my theories is that they were trying to reproduce the 12022 with that machine. Um, and then uh, recently we have, doing, we have been doing the Apollo communication restoration, so eventually we'll hook it up to an AGC. So we have the whole probably a little bit over half of the electronics in the spaceship. So that, that sent us in a completely different direction, microwave uh, and stuff like that. So the Apollo stuff is keeping us busy. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys went through 110 view graphs in 45 minutes. So if you are not exhausted, uh, we'll take questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK, we'll start over there. For, for uh, if I remember right, you mentioned that Mike had a simulator for, for the AGC that he was trying to fly this orbiter, but it wasn't working. So he wanted to get the real one. I must have missed what the problem was with his that maybe you discovered with the real one that was causing his technology. It's very, very edge cases, right? So when you get, uh, when you do the emulation via software, you try to emulate all the instructions and they are described mostly appropriately, but in certain really weird situations, it's not told what it should do. So it was a bunch of edge cases and timings that you could only, uh, you would really have Mike try to explain to you what it is. It's going to be a very technical explanation. For Mike not to find it, it was really, really involved. And even the FPGA exact uh, replica, it did not lead him to the fold. He had to go to the actual wiring. So something really intricate. But uh, once he got that, he got his emulation, of course, working. And the orbiter was working way before we repaired the AGC. As soon as he beeped it, he knew. So you had a full set of schematics and a full dump of the software to build the simulator? Yeah, it took him years, right? The set of schematics, he got some from Don, and then some from, eventually he got it from Eldon Hall. But it was a detective work to find who had the pieces, and they didn't, because he didn't want to tell first. Uh, and then the, um, the, uh, the software, they had to scan one of Don Isles thing and then they have to redo an assembler and that the scanning is full of errors and then they have to make it until it reassembles exactly the same they don't have all the documentation of, of the assembler so it's uh, years of work uh, to get to that point but yes they had they had full schematics full software wow. yeah. now uh said the uh, agc was 70 pounds how much of that was just the metal chassis very very little so the the, the what is it made of? It's made of something that weighs nothing. I can never remember. Is it beryllium or no? Titanium? No. Another one. Magnesium? Magnesium. It's a magnesium case. Ooh. So you, all these electronics, by the way, is the same. Uh, you take it, you go, oh, it's so heavy. And it has this big case to it. And you think it's the big case. Then you take the case, the case weighs absolutely nothing. It's way, way lighter. <laughs> so it's all the electronics in there. Are they concerned about magnesium being flammable? It burns extraordinarily hot. 
Uh, they must have been concerned about everything that <laughs> burned, right? So b big difference between block one and block two is that uh, is that fireproof stuff and everything's hermetic, right? And that saved the, the, the butt of Apollo 13, right? Because their their ship became full of water. If they had repaired up in block one, they would have gone kaboom, right? Any other questions? What was the failure rate of this? These, these, you saw the women leaving the core rope. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that they, you know, they had a set of plans and they, they wove it together and uh, clearly they tested it afterwards. What was the yield on that? Did they have a whole bunch of bad ones or were they pretty good at it and they all just worked from right out of the gate? I don't know. I know that f the modules were very rare for the that, that the yield wasn't that high on the modules that passed all the tests because and then you make one and then you submit it to torture and uh, and uh, um, the um, weaving though was computer aided after block so we saw an early block one but then the the, the um, assembler would come up with the uh, code for the machine and it will present you, you had to put your needle through two uh, eyelets that would move were driven by a machine. So it went straight from the assembler to the machine that helped the ladies, and the ladies just pushed the things through where they were told to push it. So I suspect they, I don't know actually what the yield was. It took several months to make one. So I, I yeah, lots of testing. And I don't know what the yield, and so we get, so the MIT people will just talk to you uh, all the time, we get Zippo zero nothing from Raytheon, absolutely nothing. Is it known where all the other AGCs are? I mean, when you're acting like this was, and, 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 please don't laugh, but acting like it's super, super rare, but I mean, there were quite a number of other, they, is it not known where they all are? It, it, we pretty much know, yes. So, so it's a very tight-knit community. Uh, the only ones that are flown are you no know, gone, right? They are in museums. Um, we, in the course of doing this, we found uh, the one that was in the CM. It happened to be at the MIT. Mu you remember when I was, the, 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 was talking about the ground test in the vacuum chamber? The AGC in the LAM and AGC in the CM. The AGC in the CM is uh, at the MIT Museum. We identified it for them. They didn't know which one they had. So it was a cousin of ours. And the, there was a third one of that series of three. And that one got sold at auction, and our auction had us uh, identify it. And g who, guess who had it in his attic, not telling us during the whole time? Don Isles. <laughs> <laughs> so here was Mike trying to skip an attic, and the thing, and you know, the Don has, a, has, has another AGC in his attic and oh doesn't tell God. anything. Then he waits that we repair it and say, oh, here's one for. <laughs> 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 We, we know where that one ended up. It ended up at the uh, Computer Museum of America. So we can, we could, uh, we are very friendly with them. Um, we, we kind of collaborate when we want to buy something. We don't want to bid against each other. So we all talk to each other who's going to get that one. So we don't overbid. I'm surprised that they're not in embargoed for selling to a private entity that doesn't disclose who they are because of the cultural and National significance, <laughs> historical value of the thing. It's surprising that they can just disappear. Yeah, no, no, man. So, so uh, Jimmy got into trouble. He said, "Where do you get that stuff?" And, and he, he says, "That's why he has the the letter disposal. Why the government disposes it? They have rules. They cannot just give it to somebody. They have to sell it at public auction." Uh, so I have to go a hundred times back. But you remember that sheet, right? Mm -hmm. And he had to show that to the bad guy that were at his door. Right? Is this mine? You guys signed over here that you weren't going. And you know, the vast majority of them have been lost, right? They have been melted away, unfortunately. Yeah, back there. Did any of the, these modules uh, see uh, further use on other space programs? Uh, Ye ye yes, or oh, on other space programs. Well, like, did NASA reuse some things built? Yes, yes, yes. The F F8, right? On the F8 pallet, there are parts that went to the moon and back. Oh, wow. From Apollo, there is part from Apollo 7, 9, and 14. So, yes, they reused the stuff. Like, 
Yeah, yes, well, the, the, uh, absolutely. The, the, uh, the, the, communication, the communication setup that we have, that's NASA stuff, and we know it, as they have, it was for the Apollo spacecraft. They changed the frequency. Uh, we matched it with a later satellite, so the, uh, the, and it's the same transponder that was in Apollo. They reused the stuff when they could, so and they, they, cert they certainly did. And, and, but they lost a lot of it. I, I don't think they completely appreciated it. No, it, it was not expected. You, you have to put yourself, you know, they went Merc you know, Mercury. We haven't even gotten a man to space to make the announcement that we're going to go to the moon, right? <laughs> then we fly somebody on Mercury, then we do Gemini, then we do Saturn V, then we go to the moon in a span of nine years. No, a little bit more, uh, t 12 years if you count, no, 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 11 years, no, 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 10 years, 10 years. And then you, uh, okay, I, I have to stop, but anyhow, they say, well, next step is shuttle, the next step is Mars, right? Well, out with the old stuff, and they wouldn't think that we wouldn't go back there for 50 years. And only when you look at what they did, you realize the enormity of what us engineers had achieved, basically. Okay, so we'll continue the conversation outside in the hallway. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs>